new block which has just been prepped and ready for assembly. Making sure that everything is super clean, we start to install the bearings onto the block. Getting it ready to install the crankshaft. The bearings we are using are the ACO race bearings. After the bearings are installed, we add on the bottom thrust bearings. Lube up both sides so it can be nice and sticky up to the block so they don't fall out when we install the crankshaft. Notice how we're pointing at the top of the thrush washers. Keep that in mind because we'll come back to that soon. Now we grease up the bearings with our assembly lube. Once they're all greased up, we install the crankshaft. This is just a 2JZ GE factory crankshaft that came from this motor to begin with. They're forged from factory, they're really strong and they're real good. These are known to handle around the 1000 horsepower mark and suits exactly the power mark we're aiming for this engine build. Now we move on to installing the main cab bearings. Putting assembly lube just like before, also on both sides of the thrust bearings. These caps are numbered 1 to 7 and they also have a little arrow pointing forward on the engine, forward being the side of the crankshaft pulley. These are the ends of the thrust bearings I mentioned before. These need to slide in correctly and fit up to the points of the pair of bearings we pull before the crankshaft was installed, so keep that in mind. Now that that's all on, we can move to the rest of our main caps. First by taking off the old bearings, wiping it down and make sure it's clean, and installing the new ACL race bearings. Prep it up with some bearing assembly lube and just repeat that process to the remainder of the main caps. Making sure again that the arrow is facing forward on the engine which is the front of the crank pulley side. Now we put in the remainder of the main caps, we bolt them down hand tight, spin the crank around to make sure it spins freely. Once that's all sorted, we set up the torque wrench to 44 newton meters of torque, which is what is recommended from factory. As you can see, we are torquing down the bolts, starting from the middle and working our way outwards. Once this process is complete, it's also then recommended to turn the bolts an additional 90 degrees. The way we ensure that the bolts are turned an extra 90 degrees, we take a marker, mark a line facing down on the bolt, that way we know the bolts have been turned to that 90 degree mark and then everything is torqued down to spec. Now that we can see that everything is torqued to spec, we can turn the crank by hand to make sure everything is spinning freely. Now time to install the pistons onto the rods. Here we're going with the standard 2JZ GE piston, factory Toyota. These are called free floating pins which hold the piston onto the rod and these are the two clips that hold them both into place. The clips are really tricky to get into the piston but once they're into the groove they're in with that satisfying click and there you go. Also making sure to get everything lubricated with some assembly oil before putting it all together. Lightly tapping the pin into place as these are standard pistons going onto aftermarket rods and they may be a little bit tighter than usual. But once everything's installed once again, move it around to make sure it moves around freely. This dot on the top of the piston is indicated that it should face the front of the engine once again. We've got a side-by-side -side comparison of the old and new rods and pistons.
can definitely tell why the VVT-i GE rods bend and break, but the pistons will be perfect for what we need them for and this is why we chose to stick with them. Before installing the pistons and the rings we've got to make sure that the bores are clean from any debris and lube them up with some assembly oil. Now our pistons are ready for us to install the piston rings. The first rings here are called oil springs, which is a spring that pushes out on both the top and bottom ring. Then we have piston ring number one and piston ring number two. We're going to have to measure the ring gap inside the bore before installing them on the piston. Getting the ring to a nice square surface is a good idea to use a piston to make it level inside the bore. Now using a filler gauge we measure the appropriate ring gap, which is right to our spec so no need for any grinding for us. Before we install the rings we have to make sure that they are the right way up. Looking closely on the rings you can see a little uh, letter N on them which ensures that this is the right way up. Now we can install the rings onto the piston, applying some assembly oil onto them to ensure they slide up and down the bore without no scoring or scratching. Also lube up the piston installation tool and make sure the piston ring gaps are in their desired position. Assembly grease on the rod bearings and now we're getting to the ARP rod cap bolts ready. The washer only goes on one way, there is a taper on the inside of the washer which fits up inside onto the taper underneath the bolt head. Once all the washers are on correct, we can grease up the thread and underneath the bolt head or washer. Now the pistons and rods are ready to be installed. We tilt the engine to a 45 degree angle to make installing the rod caps a little bit easier. After that's been tightened to spec, we turn over the crankshaft and make sure it slides up and down smooth with no scoring or scratching along the bores, continuing this step all the way through. After installing all the pistons, we turn the crankshaft over once again to make sure it all turns easy and freely. Also checking out the bores, we can see where the gaps are on our piston rings through the residue of the assembly all sliding through the gaps. Now our rotating assembly is all installed and assembled, we're excited to see our engine starting to take shape. Moving on to installing the rear main oil seal with the housing, we use a silicon gasket maker along the seam to ensure we don't have any leaks coming from the rear main oil seal, because let's face it, no one likes any oil leaks especially coming from the rear main. Now we move on to the front, installing our 2JZ GTE oil pump, mainly because they flow more oil than the standard GE pump. Once again applying silicon gasket maker before we install the pump. Once that's all in and bolted up, then we can fit the crank seal. Lightly tapping in the crank pulley, notice that there's a little keyway on the gear and the crankshaft so you, don't, you can't go wrong. Now we can flip the engine over start preparing the surface to get the sump on. First things first, we apply a layer of silicon as a gasket maker, spread that all out, fit up the upper sump pan and then we can zap all those bolts into place. We've already tapped an oil drain hole for the turbo return system in the sump prior to installing it. It's always a good idea to get that hole made while the oil pan is out as it's easily accessible.
you can see here that we've made the hole just a little bit bigger than the fitting to ensure we have maximum oil drainage with no back pressure. Now installing the oil level sensor. This has a little float on the end of it and throws a little warning light if the oil level gets too low. This is what is known as an oil baffle. Basically helps separate the splashing oil from the spinning crankshaft from the rest of the oil inside the pan. Next, installing the oil pickup. This is where the oil is picked up from the pan and sucked through to the oil pump. Once that's all zapped up to spec, the oil pan goes on with a generous amount of silicon to ensure that never leaks. Now we start getting ready to install the head. We start by applying the supplied ARP grease on the head studs. This is the allen key bolt meaning that's the top of the stud and this is how we're going to install them. So putting grease around the threads, the top and bottom, bottom first and screwing them into the block. It's also a good idea to grab a rag and wipe around the stud making sure that there's no grease on the surface where the head gasket will go and the head will sit on. Now we're installing the head gasket, we're just installing a, a factory Toyota NA head gasket. I know a lot of people go with the MLS multi-layer steel factory GTE head gasket but we just went with the NA gasket because we have good experiences with it running it in the Supra. Now just giving the head a quick wipe down and check before we can install the head. Now on to removing the cams and by doing so we have to remove the cam caps to start securing the head onto the block with the rest of the ARP hardware. Notice that the caps are all in line next to each other with their cams as you don't want to mix them up but even if you do they're numbered from 1 to 7 on the tops so you can't go wrong. A fun fact about 2JZ engines you actually can't install the washers into the head with the head studs installed so you're going to have to remove the head studs one by one to fit the washers in first and then once the washers are installed then you can reinstall the head studs it's a bit more time consuming but hey it is what it is once the washers are in and that's all finished we can move on to securing the nuts onto the studs again with the grease supplied by ARP onto the nuts and on the threads before installing them. Nuts are all in, now we can move to the stage of tightening the head down to the block. We're going to be tightening this down in three stages, starting by tightening them all down to 40 Nm which is around 30 foot pounds of torque and then they are all tied in a specific way too, started from the inside and working your way outwards. Next, moving up to 80 Nm which is around 60 foot pounds. And lastly we take the big boy torque wrench out and tighten them down to a further 115 Nm which is just over 80 foot pounds. I think it's around 84, 85 foot pounds. Now that the head is all on and torqued to spec, we can start installing the cams. First we grease up the cam lobes with the grease supplied by Kelford cams. Then we can start applying assembly lube on the parts where the cam caps will bolt up to. These are Kelford 272 to 278 degree cams. Some people may think it's a bit overkill, but let's face it, the build is for us to enjoy and to bring out exciting content for you guys, so why not? Installing the cams can be a bit tricky and could cause the cams to snap in half if they're not installed in the correct procedure. You have to be super careful with how you install the cam caps. 
Notice that we just have them on hand type for the time being and we'll get back to this shortly. And in goes the intake cam, again with the same procedure as the exhaust side. Here's a pro tip for you guys, putting a bit of grease inside the cam seals, crank seals and rear main seals helps them slide in a bit easier and helps the spring stay inside the seal and not pop out during installation. A little bit of silicon goes underneath the front cam caps so you can make sure no oil leaks come out of it and then zap these down hand tight for now also. Now that all the cam caps are hand tight, we can start to torque them down to spec. Here's a little picture on the bottom right hand corner for you guys to reference off. Uh, basically, we're bolting these down to 20 Nm, which is around about 15 foot pounds. Moving on to installing the water pump, as you can see here, we have a brand new OEM Toyota water pump and a Mishimoto thermostat. Now before installing the water pump, we've got to put this seal onto the block. You want to make sure that it's instilled inside its groove and by doing so, we put a bit of rubber grease as we used before on the crank seals just to hold it in there before the water pump sits on there. Now we can move on to installing this backing plate. This backing plate has two indents on the top which is how we're going to line up the cam gears into their desired positions. The exhaust cam gear is pretty straightforward, just simple bolt on. But the VVTi gear as you can see here, we're putting a bit of rubber grease around there which is going to slide onto the cam, into the cam seal nice and snug and make sure it's perfectly aligned before we can start torquing it down. Now we'll put the VVTi gear bolted up. Uh, we've got to make sure that this is correctly torqued down to spec which is 58 foot-pounds. We hold the cam from the top with a shifter spanner to make sure the cam doesn't spin. Uh, now we put the tensioner pulley, torquing that to spec two, and we triple check the cam gears and make sure that they're all aligned. Also with the crank is all aligned before we can install the time belt. As you can see, the VVTi gear does spin and that's completely normal. Just make sure these two marks are lined up and that's the correct mark for it. Timing belt goes in and as you can see we like to use soft jaw alligator clips to hold the belt into place. Next we install the belt tensioner and what this does is it tensions the belt once the pin is pulled as you can see there this is the pin. Once that's been done we can turn the motor over two revolutions make sure everything is lined up properly and the belt's tight and make sure that all the marks on the backing plate and the crank on the bottom are all once again lined up after those two revolutions. Also installing this keeper, this basically guides the belt to stay in place and limits the chances of it of moving and slapping around inside the cover. Same thing goes with this plate here. Once again holds the belt into place and make sure it doesn't come off the crank pulley. Now we can put the timing cover on before we can put the balancer on. Now for this build we're using an ATI super dampener. It was a bit fiddly to get it on the crank but um, as long as you're following the uh, instructions that ATI supply with the balancer you'll be good. There's actually also a torque install guide on the balancer itself so you can't go wrong setting that up either. Now that the timing side of the engine is all sorted we can fit up our cam covers. But before doing so, we install silicon onto the corner of the cam caps. As you can see there, because they're known to leak out oil, if you don't do that, we lube up the cams with some fresh oil one more time, and then we can start whacking the cam covers on. Now that that's all on, we can install the cam sync sensor. This um, sensor basically tells the computer where the intake cam is located in relation to the crankshaft. The 2JZ non-VVTi GE engine, which is in our Supra, actually doesn't have this intrusion for this sensor and that's why we had to install the trigger kit on the Supra build for this exact reason. Now for the VVTi oiling system, this is the VVTi solenoid filter and this basically pulls oil from the block and feeds it into the cam cap which then feeds it to the VVTi gear and into the solenoid and with Toyota's magic, this system advances the cam timing which improves power and efficiency.
nice work together. Guys, and we're finally done with this QJZ GE BVTI build. It's been a long process. We hope you guys have enjoyed this full engine build. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them down below in the comments. But we are really excited to get this in the car. And for all of you that stayed right till the end, you need a sneak peek to what's coming soon. <laughs>